Thank you all for coming. We have a full house. All 160 seats were sold out. Uh. <laughs> um, my name is Apoorva Mehta. I'm the interim CIO um, hope for a short period of time. Um, and again, uh, thank you for coming. This is our ninth annual celebration uh, conference on teaching, learning, and technology. And it's a result of partnership of five um, happy departments, I should say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Office of Faculty Development. Um, so, so is that like a key word, happy? Uh, happy, uh, right. right. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's Office of Faculty Development, uh, Center for Innovative Teaching, uh, Healy Library, CAPS, and IT. So all of us have come together and put together a really great program for you. Um, and uh, I hope that you will uh, spend the day with us um, right up to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we are using uh, some technology. Uh, if you'd like to tweet, uh, we have a slide on, um, uh, on, on our tweet hashtag. It's uh, hashtag UMBTLT. Uh, we have other people that are retweeting, uh, a couple of people taking pictures and pushing the message out. So, so I really hope that uh, you will take part uh, in our social media experiment as well. So um, you clearly are not here to, to listen to me. So I'm going to uh, hand the mic over to the chancellor. Uh, and he will introduce uh, the dean for uh, CAPS, uh, Phil DeSalvio. So, chancellor. Don't go anywhere. So um, I've never had an opportunity to thank Aperva publicly for serving as our interim, interim CIO. And I think it's important that we always say thank you. Thank you to you for caring about this institution and treating it with care during your tenure. And I'm so grateful to you for stepping up. Um, please let's give him a round of applause for his work. The man over here, Harry's got, Harry's got the camera going. And I'm just grateful to you, man. Thank you. Thank you. And for always allowing someone to come and help me learn something or do something in the IT area. So thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I'm so glad to be here this morning. I'm excited to see all of you. Thank you for doing this today. I know that this is a very busy time of year for all of us. And so for you to continuously come out to share with each other, to sort of build on your capacity for this institution and for yourselves is something I'm so grateful to each and every one of you for. Um, you have an amazing day planned. You know, when Phil and the Perva and others were telling me about this opportunity um, with all of the things that we have lined up on this campus today, I wanted to make sure I at least had a chance to stop by in the beginning to say hello and thank you to you. There's so many engaging workshops and so many engaging presentations this morning and all day and so many opportunities to connect and share what you're doing as faculty, what you're doing as instructors, as staff, as students, and as administrators. I love the fact that all of us are together, sharing with each other. You know, I see my colleague John Saltmarsh out there. I tell the story of how brilliant he seemed to me in the class about technology. Until one day I happened to scurry into the library and end up in the same room that he was learning from. And I tooled up a little bit myself, and we could begin to have some conversations together as we approached how we were going to teach together in the classroom. And I at least was able to understand what he was trying to tell me years and years and years ago about how we can be more effective if we use what we have and understand what we have in its use a lot better. So this work in and out of the classroom is something that I'm so proud of. I've experienced in this opportunity to promote excellence in learning is something that I really appreciate that each and every one of you are doing. I'd like to take a moment to thank you. One, for putting together this conference. 
and for participating. You know, there are lots of these plans that happen around the university, but to come in here and see a full house on a Monday morning, very early, after you've, you know, just finished teaching your faces off, or going to class, or doing all the things that you do here, this event is a great representation of exactly what you are setting out to explore and engage with today. Collaboration, co-learning, and also co-teaching. And I love that model. And the fact that you've been here and you have involvement from everyone, from faculty to students, is phenomenal. And so thank you for that. That's a model for this institution and others. This is what you all do so well here at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. It's what makes all of us so proud to be a part of you and to have each and every one of you in our lives. It's what we were known for throughout this system and throughout this um, city, as a matter of fact. And it's why we excel as an institution. It's why I'm incredibly proud of each and every one of you and how you continually strive for greater understanding to improve our work, your teaching, and the kind of learning that happens in this environment. You truly embody what it means to be educators, but you also understand that we all have something that we can learn. And when I look around and I see some of you in this room ready to learn, that's amazing. So thank you for that. This is why we're all here at this institution, because we have drive, a passion for teaching, a passion for learning, and a passion to impart knowledge, to draw from each other, but also to pass it on to each other. Your passion for me personally is energizing, and your aspirations to continually, to continually better our approaches and to demonstrate your commitment and your dedication is something that I'm just so honored to be a part of. Thank you for proving once again what makes our faculty, what makes our students, what makes our staff, what makes our administrators something special. What makes this community one that I love coming into every day and I love serving every moment of the day. It's because of each and every one of you that I thank you today for doing something as special as coming together to prepare for a better University of Massachusetts, Boston. Thank you for that. Now I want to bring up to the rostrum someone who has been a wonderful colleague, our Dean of College of Advancing and Professional Studies, Phil DeSalvio. Come up here, Phil. You know, um, he sort of wears the fact that he has what some don't have, this notion that he was a university, he's a University of Massachusetts Boston alum. And so he carries that with him all the time, and he brings that passion with him to his work. What I love about him is that he's one of these kind of people that puts his money where his mouth is. He talks about being collaborative, but he also talks about supporting initiatives throughout the university and has done that. And I'm so grateful to him, not only for his commitment to this university, but also to his, for his commitment to making sure that when he sees it and he knows he can help it, he tries to support it. And I'm so grateful for that. He's going to introduce our phenomenal keynote speaker, Wendy Shapiro. And I want to thank you all again. Have a wonderful day over here. I'm going to hang out as long as the guy in the yellow tie allows me to before I have to go over to a Harvard Pilgrim event and then on to um, lots of things. And I hope I see you all at our book signing later on today. Just come by if you can. Uh, you'll love the book. And um, there's lots of them over there. And I I'm, I'm know we'll be giving away some as well as you know, taking donations for others. And so I'm looking forward to seeing you all later on. Thank you. At the end of such a tough day, I understand it if you can't make it. However, if you get a chance, stop through. Okay? Thank you so Thank much. You. Phil. Thank you. And yes, that was a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> the check's in the mail, Chancellor. 
Um, good morning, everyone. I have the distinct honor of introducing you to our keynote speaker today, Dr. Wendy Shapiro. Uh, Wendy is joining the College of Advancing and Professional Studies as the Associate Dean of Learning, Design, and Technology. And I'm so happy that, uh, <laughs> that this has happened today. Uh, you have to know this is a new position, a newly created position. And, and when, you, when a dean tries to create a newly created position, it's, um, it can be a challenge. It can be a challenge. Last year at this time, I f first met Wendy. So over a period of year, we had uh, a lot of conversations. Um, and uh, I'm so happy that you're here today. I think Wendy's the ideal person to serve as the keynote speaker at our, at our conference today, and I think she's going to share with us some insights that I think is going to help set the tone, and I think is going to add to the themes that are being discussed today. So let me tell you a bit about Wendy. Um, she will be serving as the academic leader of the graduate instructional design program and working closely with the great Judith Erdman. Um, In her role as Associate Dean of Learning, Design, and Technology, she'll also be working closely in supporting the work of the instructional support team. She'll be contributing to the important research of the CAPS Center for Excellence in E-Learning. And Wendy will be serving as the CAPS campus-wide voice for new teaching technologies. You know, CAPS plays a unique role here at the university as a, as a curriculum and educational technology innovator. We see Wendy serving as a bridge builder um, between CAPS and the rest of the university. And this requires someone with the right combination of academic experience, of knowledge, and leadership savvy. And I think you'll see that. You'll see that quickly. And she really brings those qualifications to this position. Um, I've seen it in her accomplishments, in her academic leadership, in, in her experience in instructional design, in her experience in learning technologies, and curriculum development. And her CV demonstrates that. And everyone we've talked to about Wendy supports that. We're going to see through her work in working with, with Judith, we're going to see the graduate program in instructional design reach new levels of distinguishing itself through national ranking. I am fully confident that this graduate instructional design program will be ranked, nationally ranked. Uh, Wendy, I think, will also be instrumental in helping to bring the important learning technology research and curriculum innovation that we do here at UMass Boston to true national prominence. And I, I can tell you that I'm fully confident that Wendy is going to do that. Wendy's national reputation and her professional network and her role as board of directors chair of the New Media Consortium which is an international community of experts in educational technology that's really shaping the future of, of research at research institutions is going to be a key to this. So I'm happy to introduce you to Dr. Wendy Shapiro. Uh, I know you'll welcome Wendy to her new, new home here at UMass Boston. And I look forward to your keynote address. Wendy Shapiro. So um, I, I hate for the chancellor to come back down, but maybe you would come down because this may be a once in a lifetime opportunity for like the Great Dane and the little Chihuahua to get a picture. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> in the meantime, as, as he comes down the stairs, um, thank you, Phil. That, what, a, what an introduction. Wow. And I am so very, very excited to be here. I just think the potential, I can't wait to meet all of you personally. 
one to one, learn about what you're doing. Okay, first we get a picture. Well, I'm so grateful to meet you because this guy says he's been trying for a year <laughs> to get you through whatever the bureaucracy is <laughs> to uh, make that happen. And so oh, I'm yeah, so grateful to that. Harry has always told me never to lean down, no, no, just, no, stand, just stand up and, and take the picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Listen, welcome. As I told you earlier, so grateful to have you. We're excited. This guy, you know, he's been singing and singing and singing this song. So I know it's, we're going to sit and tune it up today. That's All right. right. That's right. Okay. We're going to sing together. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you. All right. So, um, so I know I'm going to get these pictures. You have to send them to me. This is going to be great. <laughs> And so we'll get lots of pictures. Oh, they're together. tweeting, as they say. OK. Um, I'm going to ask Nevnut, did I say that right? Nevnut, Nevnut, to come help me with the PowerPoint. He's going to run it for me. I know we needed to get the title out, but the real title is Reality and Beyond. That seems appropriate. So we're going to start with a couple of questions. And what's interesting is, what does this mean right here, right now, we ask, so where do we begin? Where are we now? Where are we going? Where will we end up? But are these really the right questions to ask? You know, we keep asking these questions again and again. And, and I do not believe these are the right questions to ask. For me, it's more about trajectories and vectors and the journey and pathways. So it's, it's much more about where we're headed than where we're going to end up. So today, I'm going to take us down a path. And I'm taking us to the horizon here. And you heard Phil talk about the New Media Consortium. I'm going to only talk a little bit about that. But in fact, this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at what are some of the things that are happening in education and technology today? And what about beyond? So that's the reality. What about beyond reality? That sounds fun, huh? Let's get out there. So that's further down the path. So these are my maps. These are some of the maps that I use. And over on the left side there is the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report. This has been like a, a mainstay. Um, most of the resources that I will be talking about are free and available. And this then is critical to the way I think. Another is the research done. And I know that there are people here working with uh, educational research and kind of innovations. That book, How We Learn, that's a mainstay on how as human beings we actually learn. I don't know if any of you are, are aware of this educate, the EDUCAUSE Learning Initiative. Another, all these reports, that's where those seven things come out. But then along with that, and I would probably say that this is true and this is what's going to be amazing for me working with all of you, is the kinds of educational experiences and innovations and brainstorming and, and experiments that we could work on together as we try to discover what's possible. And, and these are the maps, and this is what has actually helped me get where I am. It's kind of like to be fearless and to try it. This particular slide, just a little bit about the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report. The 2000, this is a report that's been around for about, I believe it's been about nine years maybe a little less. But what they are looking at, and this is the higher education report, they're looking at the intersections, uh, interconnections, and it's not just technologies in education. It is the challenges that we face, the trends that are occurring, and this is what they're putting together. And what's fascinating for me is that it's not so crystal clear. The edges of what they're talking about are beginning to blur. 
And so what we need is like, how do we bring it into focus? And I have an idea. I say, shake it up, take it apart, and then put it back together again. And we're gonna start down the pathway of reality. The first thing I'm calling is spacing out. Now, I am not that familiar with all of the great things that are happening here and all the things that are planned to happen, but I'm gonna share something here with you. Um, this, now, I, you really didn't get my background, but I am coming from Cleveland, Ohio, from a school called Case Western Reserve University. Um, it is a private school. I've been at that particular school for 12 years. Um, and we have had, and, and there, actually this is kind of reminds me of Phil a little bit, we started out by saying we need to change the learning spaces. They have to be redesigned so that other and new things can happen within the space. Actually, this is kind of like one of the designs, right? It took us a year with continual interactions and reports and everything that needed to meetings to get the provost support, to get the funding, sound familiar, to get the funding to begin to try to redesign some classroom spaces. Now I know here you've got buildings. There we were able to start with two spaces. Now what was interesting, and this is where all of you come into play, you know, we can change spaces, but by itself, it's not enough. So what was critical to those of us in the academic technology group was to say we need to take part of that funding and apply that to ways for faculty development, because we were looking for ways of changing the curriculum, changing the pedagogy. And we were able to do that. So, and I'm gonna show you a video in just a minute, but what, what that meant, and you're seeing a couple of the classrooms there. It meant a summer boot camp, intensive, and this is where you brought your syllabi and you, re -cha you changed the whole thing. And then it didn't end there, because then there was an entire year that each of the faculty that were selected, they got support both in the classroom and individually as they went forward. And they got stipends. This was all part of that funding model because if you're gonna do that kind of work, you deserve to be rewarded. You need this, it didn't go into salary, it went into other things, but, and we had extensive assessment. We are now in our third year and it is going strong. I mean, it, it started out maybe a little bit more humanities, in arts and sciences. We've got people coming from the law school, from the medical school. This is something that is like, has got caught on like fire. Active learning for me really means the opportunity for a student to engage with me and with her classmates. What I learned is that the methods of teaching and learning is shared responsibility. And that's the beauty of it. Students learn from each other, groups learn from each other, groups interact. I think in particular, the classroom setting is really important to be able to do. Active learning has given me the vehicles, both technology and the pedagogy, to deepen the learning experience. It's no longer a teaching style, it's a learning style. And the emphasis is on what the students are learning as opposed to what I'm doing. You don't give up lecturing at all, but you try to engage students in a different way and have them be more proactive in the activities. It takes a little uh, extra determination to go out there and, and be open to any questions and discussions. And so I think that's really what it, what it amounts to, is trying to say, well, what things can I do that engage the students? I think as a teacher, uh, I would tell my colleagues that uh, this is a great satisfaction once you let go and use the system. It's much more fun for everybody involved. I felt that the students felt like they owned the room, the classroom, it was their classroom. It is more social, and it's intended to be so. More students can and need to participate under those circumstances, whereas I could give them exactly the same information in a lecture and a PowerPoint, I don't think it has the same impact. 
It wasn't stale was the word that they use. It wasn't stale from week to week. I get to see students animatedly talking about a topic, exchanging information, learning in front of my eyes. They were very more creative with their presentations and they asked me to share each other's presentations on Blackboard. Either it's an incredibly good bunch of students or it's working because that work was the best work I think I've ever had them produce at this stage of the, of the semester. Okay, there's another um, way of thinking about reality in today. So, you know, I'm calling it the blend. And I did get the MFA, we have nature, we have all these ways, we have podcasts, we have certainly multiple museums in Boston. This is gonna be amazing for me to be here in Boston. And I really am excited about that bottom one. Does anyone know what that is? That Artisan's Asylum? That is, do you know? Is it the improv? No, no. Yes, who said that? Yes, it is the largest maker space in the country and it's in Somerville. We are going to connect with this place. <laughs> um, and a maker space, I don't know if you've heard of maker spaces, I'm not gonna elaborate, but this is where you go, there's 3D printing, you can uh, create things out of metal and and I certainly am aware of ways of designing fabric and doing stenciling and it's, it is the large, I can't wait to get over there. So this is gonna be really quite extraordinary. So, so what's behind all of this when we talk about the blend? You know, the idea here is um, we talk about things that happen in class we talk about, and I understand this is gonna be uh, expanded as things that happen online. And there is the hybrid approach where they come together. But let me tell you that what we don't wanna see, what I am, would not be happy about, we've all heard about the flipped classroom, that's the big key term these days, the flipped, anybody not here of the flipped classroom? You know, what the, in the olden days, what that meant is you took your, your lecture, you videotaped it, you put it online, and then the kids came back and did their homework in class. That was originally where it all started. Well, it's taken on some different dimensions, yet there still is this situation where faculty are doing 45 minute lectures and putting them out there and expecting the students to watch them. Now, if it's not a movie, I don't know how many people are going to sit there and watch for 45 minutes. That is not the way to go. But there are other opportunities. We have so much more available. And in fact, imagine for a minute, you're teaching a biology class. Anybody biology professors in here? All right, do you ever teach evolution? All right, so let's use that as an example. Let me take you into a video here. Everywhere you go on this planet, on land, underground, in the air, and in the water, there's more and more life to be found. And all of it, even you, is shaped by the most incredible of forces, evolution. In Nova's Evolution Lab, you'll be climbing around the tree of life. Learn the basics from our videos, then work your way through six missions using physical traits and DNA to build out portions of the tree. Use the evidence for evolution, like fossils and where species live on Earth today, to figure out how organisms are related. Use the tree of life to battle disease, save someone's life, and probe the origins of humanity. Then conduct your own research with Deep Tree, a massive interactive tree containing over 70,000 species, each one a story of life on Earth. Play this lab, build the tree of life, which is your family tree, and discover just how connected you are to everything that's alive and everything that's ever lived. So this particular lab, if any of you are interested in, is available on the NOVA website, and it is free. And the project director, sitting right here, this is my son. Just had a plug here, right? <laughs> If anyone wants more information, you could talk to him after. Okay, so I, there are resources like 
unbelievable resources, and I bet each one of you has one, and if we even begin to share with each other, it's gonna be incredible. Now we're gonna go beyond reality. Take a little step, a few steps down the path a little bit further, and I wanna share this. I don't wanna to talk too much about an intro, except to just set the stage of what's coming up on the horizon and beyond. Now, some of you may have heard that Microsoft has come out with a brand new technology called the HoloLens. Anybody hear of the HoloLens? Ah, here, we've got someone over here, the HoloLens. Although I was not directly connected to this, there was a, it's an experimental beyond virtual reality. It's blending the virtual and the real. I'm gonna show you a video. There is a project and experimentation going on in Cleveland, Ohio with Case Western Reserve and the Cleveland Clinic for medical and health education, how to use the HoloLens for education. So let's take a look at this video. Now Mark is part of a team from Case Western and the Cleveland Clinic. We invited them to use Windows Holographic to advance medical education beyond what is possible with today's state of the art. Take it away. Thanks, Alex. Today we use a combination of cadavers and medical illustrations to teach students anatomy. This is a curriculum that hasn't drastically changed in over 100 years because there simply hasn't been another way. The mixed reality of the HoloLens has the potential to revolutionize this education by bringing 3D content into the real world. Now, one of the biggest challenges for students learning anatomy is understanding the body in three dimensions and how all the different systems fit together. Using holograms, we can easily separate and focus in on individual systems. For example, we can focus in on the femur, and students can immediately see some of the types of fractures they may one day encounter in the clinic. Now, I can leverage all of these new capabilities while maintaining the important connection with my students. When we're both wearing a HoloLens, I can see what they're looking at, what they're interacting with, I can assess their progress, and they can communicate with me and each other naturally. For example, I can see if Michelle has a question in class, or whether Gwen has a question while learning remotely. Now, obviously, a cadaver doesn't move. This makes it difficult to see the way a living body actually works. HoloLens doesn't have this limitation. Systems can be animated, to easily see how things function. Let's take a look at the center of the cardiovascular system, the heart. It's an amazing organ. In reality, it's about the size of your fist. With HoloLens, we can easily scale up the heart to let students see minute details. We can even see inside the heart to see the valves in action. This is a new way of seeing things and it has the potential to help students understand the structure and physiology of the body in a way that's just not possible today. Now what you've just seen is a vision of how HoloLens could enhance one single subject. But as an educator, it's easy for me to see that it's not just anatomy that could benefit from this technology. This could change how everyone learns. Imagine for a moment some of the other fields that could be changed. For example, chemistry and genetics, art, engineering, and paleontology. And the best part is, we get to help define that future together. I can't wait to see what you future holographic developers are gonna do with this amazing technology. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Michelle. It's, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And as I understood, because I want to understand, you know like how we use a mouse click? I don't know if you noticed, but I've been watching this video over and over because that was done at the Microsoft Big Developers Conference. So that's where he demoed it. And they, the students, his students actually created those, those experiences. But instead of a mouse click, you go like that. And when you're wearing those lenses, you can see right through them and you see that and then you see each other. And that's how you, I haven't tried it yet. I have not gotten my hands on it yet. That maybe we got our hands on some of that. That's pretty amazing. But I'm gonna end with one final story. 
And um, this is a story of, let's see, what are the words that I put together here? Ah, the story of research, technology, and humanity. Um, this is a project that was created several years ago at the University of Washington, and it was called Snow World. Now, what the purpose of creating this project, it had to do with initially children who were burn victims. When you're treating burns, the, the treatment is agonizing. And it's almost like you can't give them enough medication to handle what they have to do. So these two researchers, and I, I do have their names here, but I, off the top of my head, I can't say that I remember, is Hoffman and another faculty or another researcher. They created a virtual world for the child and the mother, if that, or the father or whomever, to go in together. And as they entered the snow world, they were able to like sled, do sledding through the snow and throw snowballs and watch penguins fly and everything was a very cold, cold environment. And they, they've done multiple studies after, but they found that this, the child did not require the same type of medication because their mind was focused on something else. And it makes sense. Now, as this project has been evolving and developing, they actually now are using it with um, soldiers in Iraq that could come back from Iraq and from Afghanistan. Again, burn victims. They've done MRIs that literally show the pathways change so that you're not getting that same stimulation to pain. This is incredible stuff that we have happening. So I call it beyond reality. It's not so far beyond because it's here right now. And I think we're gonna see some really exciting, exciting times right here, right here at UMass Boston. I'm pretty excited. So the very last thing I wanna share with you, you know, there's so many different things to create and, and, and working with our students to see where the world is taking us and where they can, they're gonna, they're gonna be out there on the path, we're gonna be following our students. So what I wanna say is if we're looking to develop leadership, then I suggest we let the students lead.